forward to them. Okay. Good evening, hello, and welcome everyone. So this is a conversation. I'm Dan Winter. Most of you know me, fractalfield.com. Our ET history section is fractalfield.com slash fusion in the blood. And I am being helped this evening as many uh, by wonderful Alex Galvez. Alex is here. And Alex has an amazing list of friends who know about and have experience with the secret space program, the super soldier program, et cetera. And by the way, if folks want to know more, Secret Space Program on Gaia TV and the Super Soldier Talk YouTube channel, many places to learn about the, the ET history as explained in the Secret Space Program. And so we're going to have some introductions in a moment, but the title of this evening's conversation, uh, and we even have notes, <laughs> uh, Galactic History, the Big Picture and the Big Physics, uh, subtitle, uh, How Some ET Races have lost their soul, colon, are we next? <laughs> so <laughs> that's the, the, the formidable subject here. And as many of you know, um, uh, the extraterrestrial history, in my view, which I have been studying for 30 years, has taken a giant leap forward in the last year or two as the secret space program survivors and super soldiers have come forward. And we see that their stories fit together meaning the government no longer has plausible deniability and the ET history becomes compelling. And uh, some of the members of the, e the super soldier uh, secret space program survivors that I particularly admire are Randy Kramer, Jason Rice, and especially Johan Fritz, who actually describes uh, you know, surviving in a conflict with the Draco and deciding that the AI black goo, there was something we could do about it, et cetera, et cetera. So we're gonna tell some of those stories about the ET history and uh, the pieces that I put together over 30 years uh, have a role to play here, specifically while Randy Kramer and the Secret Space Program survivors tell an amazing story that fits with what we've been studying for so many years with the Pleiadians and especially the Andromedans. Uh, the piece that I think we can bring newly to this picture is my specialty in the actual physics. For example, when Kramer or Johann Fritz talk about going through a jump gate or a stargate or a portal, uh, we can now describe with a plasma vortex the physics of how these things work. Or when they talk about a med bed rejuvenation, we can talk about the physics of what that is, plasma, negentropy, therify.net, et cetera, et cetera. So by adding that piece to the puzzle of a deep science, we think we can make this conversation more powerful, more compelling, and, and deeper and more fun. So I've prepared a presentation about these things for this evening, maybe 30 to 40 minutes max, something like that. But before we do that, as we just discussed with Alex, we're gonna do some more introductions of those who are here so that you have a sense of how important the comments will be later as the discussion proceeds to those who have personal experience with the secret space program, et cetera. So Alex, do you want now proceed with introductions? Is that good? Yeah, very good, yeah. So let's see who we got out here um, so far. Okay, good. And Sandalin, Sandalin is Val, yes? That's yes, Val? <laughs> Valerie, okay. yes, my partner, right. she's here. Yes, Val. and she invited some of her friends too, so. Yeah, excellent. And some of these people, I don't know, so feel free to just interject. Remember, this is an open forum. This is very diplomatic. We all have open you know, power and agreements to share our skills and ability, our gifts. Um, what, what, as, as suggested, I'd like to introduce a little bit of each one of you, Deborah. I know uh, Marina, Sean, Sibbe, I know are all involved in the higher consciousness evolution work. And in terms of their own personal experiences, either extraterrestrial, angelic or otherwise. And we're here to put the pieces together to bring it out uh, further into disclosure to those who will hear the call. That has to be clear. So uh, Deborah, you know, I know you've been waiting every week to be here for the last few weeks and, and take care of your personal responsibilities. So if you'd like, without putting you on the spot, if you want to share a little bit about yourself, Dan, how about if we uh, give everybody about, what do, you want, what do we say, like uh, four minutes each, if there's yeah, four. that sounds appropriate. In appropriate. Gallery, we're talking three minutes. So, and, uh, <laughs> well, particularly uh, those who, particularly those who have experiences here that they yeah. want to share. Yes. Excellent. Deborah, would that be okay? Sibe, Marina, Sean. Hi. Sure. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> well, my name's Deborah, and I am a hypnotherapist. 
And the reason why I went into hypnotherapy is because I was having many recalls and memories of being in the secret space program as an ultra super soldier. And I've also had memories and conscious meetings with extraterrestrials. And so that's why I went into the field of hypnotherapy to explore, um, explore these experiences more. And uh, one thing particular from last week's discussion about, um, about the greys and their souls, I actually had an experience about a year ago where I woke up in the middle of the night and I saw three, um, three beings that resembled the greys. And, but they didn't, these particular ones seemed uh, very benevolent. And they, um, these ones were the positive, the positive ones who I feel like perhaps hadn't lost their soul yet. And we communicated through a telepathic and, um, and had kind of a, um, a light to them. And, um, and they did a healing on me as well. So, um, so that was very interesting. I wanted to share this last week at the end, but I was having technical difficulties. And so, and that relates to this week's discussions about, about the ETs possibly losing their soul and us as well. But I believe it was um, maybe Serena that had mentioned about the, that how there were still, there were positive ones with the hybrids. Um, but I've had, so I've met that race and then I've met a couple other um, extraterrestrial races, but related to the secret space program, uh, that's where I've had um, not just conscious experiences, but the memories coming through in dreams. And then, um, and then in the conscious state, for example, my, my father um, being in the military says that his records were um, burned in a fire and he shows up as a missing person where I was told also that my files were burned uh, as well. My military files, which is odd because I, because in this particular dimension, I don't, um, I didn't serve in the, in the military, but I have several memories of being in the secret space program serving on different missions. I have memories on being on Mars in, um, it was called the uh, uh, Kehoe, it, there's a base on there. And I specifically remember that I'm supposed to remember the name Kehoe. And then um, I searched for, for several years on if anybody had a connection. And then I was listening to Linda Moulton Howe one day and she had mentioned about some kind of base on the moon that was Kehoe. So, I have memories um, being on the moon. I have memories being on Mars, and um, and then different on different worlds as well. Just serving on missions and just living different lives. So that kind of sums up a little bit of my memories and my experience. Wow, that's that's wonderful. And the fact that these memories start to fit together with others makes it all the more empowering. That's great. And the background in hypnosis. A really great, glad you're here. I think this will be a great discussion. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, so uh, shall we suggest Marina go next? Um, is, is that appropriate? Yes. Hello, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Um, so I'm gonna introduce myself. I'm a conscious channeler of metaphysics and spirituality. I'm a hybrid mother, a secret space program set. I work as a super soldier after psychic training and a phys as a physicist and engineer. I'm a survivor of MK Ultra Monor project. Uh, I have altars in bases in the moon and Mars and in the secret space program, uh, Black Ops uh, ships. Um, I started my awakening uh, after uh, before five years uh, of my transformation, Kundalini awakening, when I was about 15 and I started to receive contact from hybrid beings and Arturians and some Pleiadians. 
and also Andromedans, but mostly it was astral cultures and dreams. Then I was started to recall my participation in the hybrid programs. And after um, I met my Pleiadian counterpart, he's called Maiko, and we have a sexual encounter in the astral and in the physical realm, but it was not physical like the touch, it was like metaphysical encounter, exchange of energy. After those experiences, um, I started to have and receive hybrid patient presentations. Uh, I saw babies with green skin. I, I saw hybrids with gray skin, with uh, Zeta gray DNA. And I was also uh, presented Pleiadian uh, and Shakani hybrids with uh, purple iris. And the next years, I will start to remember more of my um, experiences in the secret space programs. Um, I am working, I will receive hypnotherapy sessions uh, with uh, rheologist re called Missy Johnson. Uh, she's really experiencing in this field. She offers also Zoom calls for survivors and secret space program uh, experiencers. She helped me remember more of how they use this trauma-based mind control against me, how they fragment my soul into different altars and how they will use them as again as a soldier or as a sexual altar also. Uh, I have been part also of the sexual trafficking experiences. And well, um, I have been to the moon, I have been to Mars, I have been to underground military bases, and I have worked with Nazi uh, soldiers. When I was a child, uh, they will program me with Nazi symbology. And well, you know, I didn't end up having their belief systems, but they were trying to uh, kind of like insist on a cult programming on me and use me, uh, kind of like kick me for years uh, to their service. And I think that's, um, that's kind of like the summary of my story. Right now, I'm trying to put my information out. I'm trying to um, share as much as I can about my story, about my channelings, because, you know, um, my channel has helped me, has helped me a lot in my recovery, in my healing and in my mission. Um, I really feel that a really important part of my mission is to uh, tell the people about the importance of the hybrids and the hybrid frequencies and how they are so relevant for our evolution and what's going on when they are coming here and land here. So yeah, I am, that's basically what, <laughs> that, that what is, is so, my life about. <laughs> that is so powerful and important. You have a website already, don't you, Serena? Yes, I have. <laughs> why, why don't you say what that is? Just so that it's... My website, yeah. uh, it's a website for channelings for extraterrestrial art, because I'm also an artist. And also a vlog in which I share, you know, again, channelings or uh, posts or, you know, information about my experiences. It's I also have a gallery in which I have pictures of abductee marks on my of my left knee, of my arms, you know, that I took yes. over the years, and also useful um, videos that I capture. I saw those. What's the address of your website again, just so people have it? Okay, so www. Yeah. <laughs> dot marina seren dot com. Marina Seren, S E R E N dot com. Yes. Marina, <laughs> Marina is somewhat famous in her own right, and I'm impressed with the coherence with which you speak and so many languages and so much experience. So we're grateful. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for being here. So let's <laughs> see if we can add a little pieces of science here and there. And so sure. this, we'll continue. So uh, wonderful. Uh, should we have Sean go next, Alex? Is that appropriate? Sure. Bond, yeah. Sounds good. Um, yeah, let's see. Am I showing up on the screen? We can see you and hear you. Okay, cool. Yeah, my name is Sean Bond of SAC League, SACLeague.com, also on YouTube. I'm oriented towards the sci uh, psionics uh, science of accumulating uh, wisdom and knowledge on through throughout all the world on uh, psychic abilities and how to formulate them and reverse engineer them for people and unlock their dormant abilities. I've gone uh, into this through a bunch of different uh, awakening experiences of uh, visitations of many different beings, uh, light and dark and neutral, and some very traumatic experiences and uh, temporal dilation. So much temporal dilation, I just keep going into it and uh, tracking back all the emotions that come and gotten really good at 
dealing with uh, all the pain, fracturing, and uh, putting all the pieces back together, healing it. And then uh, through all that, forcing me to awaken deeper amounts of my power in like reality warping and um, temporal maintenance. I, uh, some of the things I'm comfortable talking about, uh, like with visitations with uh, temporal uh, timeline keeping uh, factions of different races that are geared towards maintaining this planet and usually neutral ways though there's positive factions that have been negative faction um because they're concerned about the human experiment and what it will become and wanting to keep it together in a like a nice uh equation that's perfect gotten into uh memory retrieval and recovery for others and uh helping others read their temporal dilation experiment uh, experiences of compartmentalized uh, motions and experience and memory to then transfer from their super conscious subconscious to conscious. I read DNA for people that want to unlock their uh, abilities passed down to them, uh, their spirit past lives, as well as the Akashic help heal trauma and a uh, healer of um, also massage therapist and uh, um, many other modalities that I'm continuing to activate more and more. I help people turn on their dormant abilities, as I said, and uh, I found out that everyone here is here for a purpose. They're like, there's a lot of lack in this world based on huge traumas and invasions that happen around like Falls of Atlantis and other times that bring a need to free the spirits that are here and add to the equation of what is needed to outdo the forces of darkness. And everyone here has a purpose, some things that they're good at, things that are their servant genius that they're born with, that they don't even have to try, but if they know what it is, they can have that uh, permeate throughout the world. Like if they're good at defense, they just be, and then they expand into that and they add more defense to the planet or safety or healing or dream um, a management or like any type of skill like peace or miracles. And we can uh, make this world a better place if we come together. And I'm uh, very geared towards bringing as many uh, like-minded people uh, advance in any uh, thing they're passionate about their love, because that's where they become their genius in. And then I've uh, been forming a collective group of especially psionic uh, uh, laden and uh, oriented people to uh, help the world and uh, make it better. Well, that's that's great, Sean. Sean, you know, as you were talking about the, the time travel and the fractionation of memories, later when we're talking about insolment, there's one specific example of a group that admits that too much time travel was part of the fractionation where they lost their soul. And if we can put any science to that, and so that conversation will be part of uh, where your contribution is important. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for being here. That's great. <laughs> So uh, is Taya next then, Joey? Is it? Taya is very important. She's been doing work in this area in psychology and uh, your contribution has already been wonderful, Taya. Please. Oh, great. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, in uh, this life, I am a Chinese herbalist here. Uh, I've been doing that for uh, 20 years, I think. Um, well, close to. And um, I um, was a telepath um, in the secret space program I guess say primarily, but it kind of depends on what faction you're talking about. And uh, um, I've always remembered, uh, I had all sorts of weird, crazy dreams when I was a kid. And when I was finally able to put the pieces together about four years ago or so, um, it was just like uh, earth shattering uh, for me to realize everything that I had been involved in. And I actually went through a process um, as part of these past couple of years uh, remembering old dreams that I had because I mean I, I know it sounds kind of crazy to think that you can remember dreams when you had as a kid but you know these dreams were, were so vivid I mean you're so much a part of them because um, they're not dreams they're memories and so I, I um, have been trying to unravel like what's been happening to me and um, it, it's a very strange process I've been abducted by many different groups like left and right um, but probably the biggest uh, two, if we want to try and break it down to that, um, is that uh, my family was part of one of the brain drains, I believe in 1984. And um, that, that particular brain drain was um, 
well, the, it was a recruitment of, um, I have German ancestry and uh, my grandfather, um, along with my mother and father and my brothers and all of their uh, siblings. Um, so I have aunts and uncles and cousins were all t uh, taken as part of the breakaway. And, um, and so I remember living over there. Um, I was also used in their military in the same way I was used in the American military over here where you know, they abduct you and um, train you and erase your memory and that whole thing. And then I was also used um, in as part of a, the, the breakaways a deep space um, program as well, where my DNA was changed and all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, but then I was also part of the American military um, abduction process. And, um, and so Mars, you know, I was in Mars um, in, in the breakaway and and I have a decent amount of history on, on Mars. Um, but uh, I think in, in 1942, and I've been trying to piece this together, but 1942 um, with the LA Lights uh, sequ um, uh, event, um, that I think that was the first time the breakaway leveraged the United States government. I'm not sure what particular branch it was, if it was military or, um, well, I know it, for sure it was military, but but I believe that's when actually the American military uh, secret space program started. And I do have memories of actually being taken back in time as a child. And I, I, that's where I figure it was probably Montauk and things like that. Um, I'm actually trying to learn more about what, what Montauk is, but I have many memories of being a child in underground bases, talking to aliens. I remember um, uh, American um, uh, mil military uh, astronauts being um, mating with um, these beautiful uh, blonde women. Um, and that I Dream of Genie is actually a disclosure of that. <laughs> uh, so there's all sorts of like weird stuff going on there. Um, and then at, at which point um, when I was, I believe I was 15, I was taken to Mars um, in 1958 uh, as part of the American military program um, that was there. And it was a, a, a partnership, if you want to call it with a breakaway sort of, it's like we were, we were renting from them, essentially. Um, I, I still can't remember the details of the agreement, but I do know that because of the breakaway leveraging the um, earth <laughs> and the governments of earth, um, I, I do believe the American military was able to kind of, you know, create terms. And, and those terms were them getting out in space. And I believe that um, the people that the breakaway abducted um, were, became shared assets uh, between the, the breakaway and the American military. And so um, I have all sorts of, I could share some pictures if you guys want it. I could, do, I don't know how long you want me to go into this, but, but that's a really good synopsis. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. And, and you and your partner have been helping others sort their memory as well, right? Is, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. So um, I, it's kind of a long st story how I got into, to how I found this, but Evelyn Paglini has, um, she was a psychic. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she was actually on like Coast to Coast when Art Bell hosted a, a lot, um, doing predictions and things like that. And she had a meditation program called the Mind Dynamics Series. Well, about 12 years ago, I, 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 I needed something because uh, my brother had just died and that was very tragic and, and things like that. So anyways, um, so I started meditating and going to this deep process. Well, her process is to develop your psychic abilities. And when I started going into the, the deeper levels, because it's her, her process, it's not just a meditation. It's like, you know, it's visualization. You're, you're opening your third eye. You're, you're going into the, the lower frequency mental states. And so that, it is, and I think plus the herbs, it just between the two of those things and trying to heal and work through my psychological blocks in particular has opened things up. And so I'm trying to bring awareness to helping people with that through the herbs and through um, meditation and, and dream recall and, and trying to understand like the, the things that create, I'm, I, you know, I'm actually using myself as a test subject here, but, but what, what is, what are the things that make somebody able to remember? So, yeah, yes. um, and, and this is yeah. absolutely about long-term memory. That's what it, yeah. physics of ensoulment and how we gather that together. So that's the conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you to be continued, Taya. Yeah. You really, you've been wonderful already. Thank you, <laughs> Alex, for introducing. Alex, do you want to continue the introductions now? You know, the others better than me. Do you? Do you? 
but yes um we have some other people on board i don't um marianne if, you, if you'd like to introduce yourself and daryl i believe i don't know I, I, you know quite frankly i put a lot of invitations out for two key people but i just don't recognize you not right now and uh, Eva foster i'd love to introduce her as well unbelievable angelic conscious teacher so if, any of you if you want to uh, step up please do so at your own discretion um, okay, my name's Marianne, and I spoke with Dan, I contacted Dan a few days ago, and Dan uh, graciously invited me um, to the Zoom meeting. I've invited, I hope that's okay, I've invited um, my friend Daryl. Daryl will introduce himself, um, was uh, is a former military officer. Um, my background, uh, as most people, ha it, it's a bit diverse. I was um, an athlete for, for Canada, a, a long distance runner professionally on the World Cup. Um, I, in fact, I contacted Dan because I'm having, I have a very serious injury on my, my leg with, that, with subsequent surgeries and I'm experiencing a piece, piece, what I understand is a piezoelectrical phenomenon, which is quite interesting. So I, I spoke with Dan about Therify and what sort, I'm in Canada here and uh, he kindly put me in touch with Michael May. Um, and I, I spoke with what's happening and, and uh, just to get an, a sense of, of where I could get some help in that respect, because as a runner, it's really hard to rest. And I'm gonna be honest, I'm, I'm out there, which I probably shouldn't be, but it's, it's, a, tough, it's a tough situation. So I wanted to get uh, some ideas of that. Um, I'm a mediator um, with, um, well, no, have been for about 22 years and um, also had a background in academics with English literature and um, I paint now at, at uh, this time in the universe. And, and didn't you say you were paint, painting winged Draco? Do I remember? Did. Everybody want to see this? This is bad. It started off as a, a blue heron <laughs> and look at it, look at it. Uh, yes, yeah, the, the, the winged dragons. Well, it's, the, it's, the it's a winged Draco. And I started <laughs> painting these muscular legs. It's ridiculous. I don't know what I, I was supposed to do stick legs. So it's really taking off and it's running. So there you go. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. And we're going to talk about the therified plasma, that mildly introducing lucid dreaming, that if you took that to higher power level, that's what a portal is effectively. So <laughs> we'll get there. But great. So any, anybody else we should do here? Thank you, Mark. Yes, hi, Dan, Alexander, and the rest of uh, you on the call here. Uh, Daryl, uh, I actually introduced Marianne to Dan's work. And Dan, I have a shout out to Dr. Susan Cobb, who was your former roommate. And she actually introduced me to you years ago. So I've been following you. <laughs> wow, that's a memory. That's a, she had a beautiful office in Atlanta. That's, wow. <laughs> it must yes, be yes. 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, well, that's cool. Glad you're here. And uh, any perspectives appreciated. <laughs> Welcome. Happy to chat here. Great. Super. Any, anyone else then? Uh, are we? So I have a presentation ready here when we're ready. I guess Sibbe, did you want to share a little bit before we move on? Sibbe, did you I, want to share something? I, I can do a quick, a quick introduction. Uh, sure. About my, uh, I'm an engineer. I define myself. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, yeah, we're getting you. I think. Okay, great. I define myself as an engineer, but that's my internal. Uh, that's my internal description. Uh, externally, I I have a website called X Humanoids. So probably that's that's uh, that that's another <laughs> perspective on myself. As an engineer, I'm interesting. First of all interested first of all not in so much in time tracks and not so much in events and not so much on what's happening and what's going on i'm interested in uh, the technology and uh, how things are created so uh, again as an engineer i don't care about history i care about writing and reading history and uh, that's why i'm Pretty, uh, I'm interested also in artificial intelligence today because that's a big thing which is used for writing history or nowadays. Probably a lot of people still don't understand this. In practical terms, uh, again, one of my uh, uh, perspective on development is not adding up stuff on top of something that we already have. It's more deconstructing stuff and undoing stuff. So on creation and uh, deconstructing, that's uh, probably what I would call my primary focus. 
and my website is, uh, is um, contains a process that anybody can use if you just go to exhumanoid.com there's the universal conscious practice which is a process created by Konchak Pende that's a guy who lived to 94 years old uh, in the in the United States and he created this uh, process that he called universal conscious practice uh, this is not the only technology, but this is one of the technology which I, I in, in, technically call for myself personality defragmentation. Mm -hmm. Because again, uh, a lot of what we call life is usually more about going through a sequence of events, experiencing stuff, uh, getting traumatized, trying to figure out how to get out of this. So from a engineering perspective, I'm looking at it as a, a, a way of uh, creating, uh, building things. And my primary focus is on recycling, recycling that space uh, and recycling the energy because there's a lot of trapped energy there. There's a lot of frozen energy. There's a lot of wrapped energy in unconsciousness, which makes people yawn just when they start thinking of it so uh this this is what i i do i could call it for for a public uh from a public perspective uh, brain surgery <laughs> so <laughs> it's uh let's say mental brain surgery uh, because uh, i think nowadays it's one of the key things that we need as a as a race and if if we if we looking at the current context for me for many years here which means on this planet i was thinking what am i doing here <laughs> this is not my planet <laughs> well, why, it, why, why, it, this, why things are so dense here <laughs> gravity this is not my the comfortable level of gravity so Recently, this year, I finally understood why I'm here. I didn't want to miss the show. <laughs> Vasudeva, I think w this evening could be a bit of a test to see if an engineer can talk about the difference between artificial intelligence and insolment in real engineering terms. That's a, a major challenge for this evening's yeah. conversation. So test us on that question as we proceed. <laughs> Please. Make, right. Give them clear distinctions. Yes. yes, yes, see if we can do that. That's our challenge for this evening. Thank you, Brother Vasudeva. Brother Bust, 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 Bust. Um, also want to welcome Alan, Alan Rhodes. Uh, and I just should mention Alan and Sean, you may want to have an offline conversation because you're both in the uh, psionic work and Alan and Sean both in psionic work. Um, whoever didn't, uh, who else wants to share before Jan, Dan starts his general presentation? Also, want to recommend that you all post your websites now in the chat site so we all have it available to each other. Okay, phone numbers if you'd like, whatever you feel comfortable with, and what um, honors your boundaries. Okay, if anyone else would like to step up and share, I'd love to hear from anyone who hasn't shared. Please do so. Does survey want survey? Do you want to say something? Oh, yeah. Oh, hello. I am a, an unmute, right? <laughs> yes, you, we can hear you. All yes, right. we can hear you. Go ahead. I, I'm so happy to be here. And um, just a uh, just little bit history. My background is academic background is a sports science. So I've been working all my life with the uh, top athletes and, and uh, here in United States, NHL players and tennis players. So, and being a hands-on healer of 35 years, um, esoteric, after having an academic um, degree, I actually, my essence was pulling towards uh, all the esoteric studies. So I have 30 years experience with Tibetan, Tibetan philosophy, uh, Gnostics, uh, Essenes, uh, et cetera, et cetera, the Mayans, uh, basically everything we have, the Vedas we have on the planet. And now I'm working with actually with the Cosmos Federal Assembly and we're bringing back the 
the evolution plans to this um, to the space time phenomena so the human that a human can attain the cosmic uh, the spirit body the light body how to attain the inter incarnate integrate with your light body and to integrate with totalistic consciousness the god consciousness so with very advanced beings it is beyond galaxies and universes is basically the cosmic cosmic mind so i'm very fortunate to meet have been meeting in my life um, amazing amazing uh, star beings and um, literally the consciousness we we can call is unveiled so yeah wow great wow. great to be here thank you thank you wonderful all right. Well, uh, I guess I'll begin then, shall I? Or uh, we we know Alan. Alan is an expert in 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 audio uh, and uh, audio bliss and engineering and yes. Uh, what can I do for you? <laughs> and Alan has been with us at all I'm our conferences. I'm sorry, I missed the first half hour. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Many many USBA conferences. Yeah. That's right. And also our conferences in Europe, and Alan has been there. So, yes. And, and Alan is also friends with the Montauk survivors and many people. So we're glad to have you, Alan. Yeah, I was a good, good, close friend for many years of Tristan Nichols. And he, he taught me uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, technology behind it all over the yes. many years. And uh, I used to bring a lot of people up to his home and uh, try out his, his sound system which became very famous too. Yes. And, and, and I'm, I'm still working on that. And he was using a cotyledon-like, a cube octa, deca delta, and we now know the implosive qualities and that if that implosion is accurately phased through Planck, it becomes plasma projective and longitudinal EMF coherent, which is the beginning of the time travel physics. So we've learned so much since the Preston Nickel days with the uh, International Psychotronics Association and Bob Mulek. It's been a career there. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Yes, they're still going. Uh, they've, they've kind of rejuvenated themselves now, Dan. Have you, uh, do you yes. know that? Psychotronics yeah. with Mulek's son, I think, and yes, yes. Yeah, Scott, Scott is doing it, yeah. Yes. My friend, Al. And, and actually, the, um, I was gonna mention in tonight's presentation about Ken Page, who did the multidimensional cellular healing. The original hypnotic, uh, healing and reassembly of the memories of the Montauk mm. survivors. And he was with us at our farm with Mon uh, Marcia Andriola and really discovering what, how they chose uh, who to abduct for the Montauk experiments, which again has to do with who's a lucid dreamer and the physics of ensoulment, who's longitudinal coherence. Mm -hmm. And that is the subject that is a, a core subject of this evening and getting back to Vasudeva. So. Great, <laughs> because I, I want you to know that, that that's been my focus in psychotronics since the beginning. I, I met Preston, of course, in 1986 at that yeah. conference. Yeah. And um, the focus that I've had is, is like what we call today ascension. Yeah. You know, yeah. A technology that um, creates conditions for that. Uh, not right. necessarily driving the brain or the body into a submission to <laughs> to ascension, but but to create a a, a condition yes. uh, in your whole body to uh, to slip right into. It. I mean, to you know assume it. And and so that when when the body becomes coherent enough with that longitudinal EMF bubble, the result of the implosive charge compression related to bliss and Kundalini and the onset of lucid dreaming is directly related to the ability to be plasma projected in the time travel, whether it's Jody Foster's dodeca in contact or Preston Nichols' deca delta antenna. And uh, the problem was a fractionation of memory actually, and why they needed hypnotic therapy when they came back. And it's very mm -hmm. interesting that, uh, you know, I've been tracking the uh, Gosha's uh, Tegaten Pleiadians as at the Cosmic Agency YouTube channel because we had other original contacts with those same Tikatan Pleiadians for years. And mm -hmm. when their hero, Swaru, admits one of the ways they lost, they lost it, they lost effectively in Solman, she did, and fractionated mm -hmm. the personality was specifically, and she admitted it at one point, too much time travel. <laughs> and, and, and when, uh, you yeah. know, 
when William Bueller was teaching us advanced Templar physics, uh, goldenmean.info slash Bueller, B-U-E-H-L-E-R, one of the first things he talked about was of the task of the Templar agenda of the repair of the fabric of time, which was uh, some of the bleeding holes in the ore of earth that attracted parasites like mm. some of the parasitic grays, for example, Tumeris, he called them, uh, was those holes in the plasma aura of earth due to too much time travel, <laughs> Montauk. Mm -hmm. So how would an engineer think about what is the repair of the fabric of time? Or in fact, how do you restore fractality in time? Well, you know, the language of Einstein doesn't help much here. It isn't about bending space time. That's the wrong way to think about it. Right. It, it's actually the simple physics that mass is rotating charge. That's obvious. That's the inertia. And gravity is the implosion of charge, charge acceleration towards center due to fractal conjugation. That's the cause of gravity. So what is time? Time is the period of that same rotation of charge. So the reason time speeds up when you accelerate is because there's a translation of vortex inertia as you accelerate the vortex and the rotation rate speeds up, hence the speeding up of time. So time is simply the rate of rotation of charge, nothing more. But once so, you, be yeah. once we'll you able to begin to think about that, what is the restore of the fractality in time? It's the navigation of those vortices when they're permissively embedded in, think about a dodeca or a fractal, that means there's a coherent thread between them, which mm -hmm. does not fractionate. So repairing the fabric of time relates to restoring implosion to event history. Right. And that, uh, once again, I always like to speak very highly of, of the Therify <laughs> whenever I get a chance to. And uh, that translation of vorticity is what occurs in those glass plasma vessels. And, uh, but you, did, you just pointed out something that was more important, that it's the, it's the, well, of course, it's gonna speed up as the vortex gets lower and lower. Now, and what's happening at the same time is those wavelengths of the phi ratios are going up in frequency and smaller in wavelength at the same time this vorticity is happening. And eventually you, have like what Guy Obolensky had a you get like a kind of a shock wave it turns from vorticity into a plane uh, longitudinal exactly wave front exactly right? exactly and that's what Bearden talked about and it's the propagating longitudinal wave front that oh, Einstein wow. did not understand is introduction of the physics of gravity waves and Bearden called it gravitobiology because it's the essence of those compression wave fronts becoming mm. centripetal that causes life force and biology. So, and that longitudinal EMF coherence we've been teaching for years mm -hmm. now is the physics of the Ba from the Ka, the Kesjian body, rainbow light body, which is what you take with you when you lucid dream, when you die successfully, when you plasma project, and when you time mm -hmm. travel. So getting mm -hmm. the aura to that stage of coherence, that bubble coherent longitudinally, is the physics of then being able to implode and the phase velocities speed up and you pass through that center point, which we now is golden ratio exponents of Planck, the physics of neg entropy. And as you are squeezed down through that Planck threshold, then the transverse inertia becomes longitudinal and your plasma projectable, which a dodecahedron enables. That's how the cones are lined up, which is again, mm -hmm. Jody Foster in contact. So what are we learning about the physics of ensoulment? Why did all of the teenagers they abducted for Montauk and all the secret space programs, the first ones they abducted were always the lucid dreamers. And even when the Greys, by contract to the Greycos, did the abductions, as we said many times after the Gariata Treaty, apparently at least 90% of those had some indigenous blood, hint, lucid dreamers. So the ETs were always looking for the lucid dreamers. And even this is the story of uh, famous Charlie, the lead Draco at Montauk, if you believe Michael Ash, the mm. chief time empath at Montauk. I had many conversations. And um, <laughs> first of all, why did I, they, I, go ahead. I, I sort of remember that. I, so anyways, I'll just, you know, I can sort of verify that. Let me just ah. that. <laughs> yeah, so, 
Yeah, yes. can I just brief this? Because we have so many brilliant minds. Is, I, I know you have a presentation on point. Is it? Can we ask questions during your presentation? <laughs> sure. L let's try to stay on the thread. But yes, yeah, sure. Well, let's have some fun here. <laughs> but <laughs> but so what? Charlie, the lead Draco at Montauk, when he had that fight, uh, famous story about somebody tried to tra take on a Draco, and they felt that vice-like grip, the mind meld with the Orion Queen Mog, it's called. Mm. Um, the the they still needed those teenagers to do something. And that was steer the time chair, hint, because they could not. Why? Because they were not the lucid dreamers. Now, what does it mean in physics to have the kind of aura that can steer an imploding wavefront? Alan, you called it correctly, I believe a shock wavefront, which is a longitudinal wave propagating from an implosive center point. And that acceleration reason it's travel in time is because it's a travel in phase velocity where embedded rotations enabling coupling with other rotational inertial frames of reference. Right. Once you understand that the only physics of what's called coincidence is capacitive charge coupling. So we, we developed that physics all at goldenmean.info slash coincidence. Right. It's very clear when you see the major events in history, and you see the golden ratio cascade there, it's a beautiful article. Though the physics of coincidence was the fact that this rotation could couple with that rotation if they're locked in phase. Yes. And that's how coincidence and miracles, all this cool stuff. Wow. That's an introduction to the physics of the restoration of fractality in time, enabling the charge coupling that's why it's so important in physics these days when they, you know, they first discovered, they called it time reversal, but they only meant return to order, increased neg entropy when it was first measured in phase conjugate optics. So what they called time travel, <laughs> return to the past in phase conjugate optics was simply an increase in order because that enabled, that increase in order enabled, quote, the repair of the fabric of time. And that is going to then return to a theme we're going to talk about this evening, hopefully, which is what is the physics of how races lose a soul or regain their soul? And why is it that so many ETs who are here being parasites, their agenda, quote unquote, even hidden agenda, has to do with using something in Earth human DNA library to regain how they lost their soul. That, that's the... That's the key theme we'd like to sort out in this evening's conversation, the subtitle, how some ET yeah. races have lost their soul, are we next? Go ahead. Isn't, isn't it interesting that the, uh, you know, the, the Ursula Le Guin, the lathe of heaven, you, are you familiar with that story? The a little bit. Of heaven? Mm -hmm. Okay, it had a, a man who, uh, when he fell asleep and dreamed, reality when he woke up reality would be what he had dreamed and it went on from there and then of course the story involves a researcher who realized that and then used it for his own advantage to have this fellow dream him into his future successes but the interesting thing is about it and there's a connection to what the, was researched i think i don't know when it was in the 70s maybe maybe it was called uh, mutual hypnosis mm -hmm. where one subject would would uh, would put under would be, would uh, bring down hypnotize the second. The second would then hypnotize the first, and then they would take each other down. And at a certain point, they experienced the same reality, and they could actually see each other and walk, run around, and like it was the total reality. So, uh, the interesting thing about the alien abductions is, uh, uh, how much hypnosis might have been involved in that kind of uh yeah and we are so similar to to we, uh, lucid we were, dreaming we were doing stage hypnosis in high school when i was 17 years old and actually that's how i learned relaxation therapy but interesting the relaxation increases the conductivity that then enables the coherence of the longitudinal emf bubble hence ability to lucid dream and after we got the data that showed therify.net imploding conjugate plasma, for example, often triggers lucid dreaming. We have reports uh, at therify.net slash blog. Uh, we know why 
phase conjugate implosive plasma triggers lucid dreaming because it increases the coherence of that charge bubble's ability to propagate and literally steer that tornado. It is all about steering tornadoes. That is what it's about, except that tornado eventually is superluminal and it has to use phase conjugation to get there. Um, so, so that then relates back to our story of the physics of bliss and the physics of theta in the brain waves, so, which mm -hmm. was a core part of what we wanted to sort of include in tonight's conversation. So if you look at flameinmind.com uh, in the plots, particularly on top where you see dramatic theta, that's a, a very low frequency brain wave in the cascade of five harmonics. In that case, it was my brain waves. After 30 years of intense Kundalini, um, the five harmonic cascade starts with a huge peak in theta. It's around like four or five Hertz, very low frequency. Mm. And uh, that's where the cascade of five harmonics and golden ratio builds in the brain waves, mm. the imploding physics of bliss. And we now know that by teaching kids to make those brain harmonics, when their eyes are blindfolded, that's when they see a plasma vortex inside their head and say, oh, I'm looking through a vortex tornado inside my head and I can see without my eyes now. And you measure the brain waves and they're making those harmonics, meaning they have grabbed a hold of the vortex plasma tornado inside their head by using the right frequencies, phase conjugate cascade tuned to Planck, and they're now compressing the vortex of that tornado toward an eyeball, toward a foci, literally an eyeball. And that's the physics of vision. And that was my international presentation on the physics of vision, that the reason why when you get the bliss harmonics and 30% of people who come out of Therify report some sharpening of vision, uh, mm. and now we're, te we're using brain waves to, yes, teach, kids, to see, teach kids without, to see without their eyes. So the sharpness of vision is directly the sharpness of the, of the focus of the plasma vortex. And as we said in the last lecture here on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Dan Winter Fractal Field, approaching 2 million views. So our, our last YouTube lecture was, if you knew what a plasma vortex is and what makes it centripetal, then you can know why an object falls to the ground, what bliss is, what time travel is, what lucid dreaming is, right. what, what self-organization is, what consciousness Well, that's centripetal. Is. Yes, that exactly. That centripetal acceleration is toward counter space. Well, it, exactly. it, the opposite it, of magnetism, which, which is all volume and magnitude. It, it is where the two pine cones kiss noses accurately at Planck, basically. I was, I was curious, Dan, uh, uh, there might be an interesting connection here. Uh, what is the age group of these children that you did with the vision research with? Well, it's been shown. Remember uh, that, by the way, that article is flameinmind.com slash outer vision. And uh, the age group of those kids is in the range of about, I don't know, eight or nine up to 14 or something like that. This is incredible. Okay. That's exactly what I wanted to hear because seven to 14 was the acknowledged age group of the so-called Geller kids in the mid seventies. Yes. And they, they, it was the pre-puberty and the, the, uh, the, the juices, the psychokinesis, pre-puberty, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And um, it, it's been shown by the way, and there are hundreds of kids seeing without their eyes projects around the world, but it's been shown that adults can learn, but it's much, much harder for them. Interestingly, when Patrick Botti, who did all the programming for Flame and Mind, was with the, the most magical little girl who does this, after sitting with her for like a long time, suddenly he noticed that when he closed his eyes, he was beginning to be able to see a little vortex in his head and a little eyeball was forming. So it was contagious, literally. But, but back to the point here. So when you start to have this theta, and I think it was Marina that talked about this and awareness that you had uh, theta in your brain waves. And as that evolved, it increased your leverage on the long wave and therefore dot, dot, dot. Now, if you look at the brainwave literature 
First of all, everybody calls it theta healing, but very few people measure it, but we do, flameandmind.com. But if you look at the brainwave literature, when you get that big coherence peak in the low frequencies, in the classic brainwave literature, what do they call it? They call it access to the deep unconscious, access to the underworld. It's literally access to the long wave. Now, mm -hmm. that is such a clue to the physics of what ensoulment is, like as in Ride the Long Wave, Uncle Joe by Jose Argoyas. Well, <laughs> what, you know, when even the Draco admit, they're very candid about this, that they lost long-term memory and that has something to do with loss of soul. They knew that. They're aware of it. So precisely it's grabbing a hold of that long wave that's identical with grabbing hold of soul because it's, it's the realm within which ancestor memory lives, the collective unconscious community of saints. It's a longitudinal array and you get access to it when you can grab that longer wave. And the same low frequencies in your brainwave cascade is phase locked to the low frequencies in the EKG, which we measured mm -hmm. imploding the DNA, embedding the long wave in DNA, all the pictures, goldenmean.info slash DNA manifesto. And there you'll see the story of Glenn Ryan who did our measurements after I suggested it, measure heart coherence and you can measure the DNA braid go up. Hello. That implosion is the long wave getting in your DNA. And that's, that's called fractalfield.com slash fusion in the blood, which is the summary article about the ET history. So the beginning of the ability to create that long wave fusion in the blood is the physics of ensoulment because as any Aboriginal tells you, you know, life is about telephoning ancestors. And this mm -hmm. is the physics of how you telephone ancestors. <laughs> uh, actually, you know, Karatkov went to where the Kogis phoned their ancestors and measured the fractality of the air. <laughs> But that's because their longitudinal embedding is possible. So let's relate that back then to our big picture here, which is, mm -hmm. is there a little story now for which races are, have, the ETs have been a bit more parasitic than others? And yeah. is it true that they're the ones who are here to get some piece of the DNA library here because they lost their soul. And what does it mean for a race to lose their soul? And how is that that there's some recipes for that in the DNA library of Earth? And why are they only abducting the lucid dreamers who've got that long wave? <clears throat> so. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And may I suggest something? Just to this conversation. When we're talking about which races are being more, or which ETs are being more parasitic. And I think we talked about this, Dan. Who and what is behind the recipes of their current vaccine? Can we do <laughs> that? Okay, I know, I know. We were talking, what's going on and who done it? I mean, this is an interesting, if we're considering the galactic history that Dan's presented, you know, when we're looking at, are, are we looking at, a? I was thinking about this, are we looking at a Nephilim group? Or is it Enki and Lil? Are they sitting there? Like, what's what's going on? Can I throw that at people? What? what? <laughs> it, it's the overwhelming question. You know, I know. Who, it, it, the, the, the question that keeps arriving is who's behind the behind? <laughs> you know, if yeah. you're if, if you're a conspiracy conspiracy theorist and trying to figure out who done it to <laughs> Earth, you know, who, uh, who, that those orders came from off world. Obviously. Of well, the recipes uh, came off world that somebody suggested. Definitely the recipes to the vaccines are coming from off planet, are they not? Well, um, what well, we can say, first of all, it would be too controversial to announce for us to announce medically that vaccines present, prevent lucid dreaming. However, what we have taught is the true experience when Valerie and I were there with Credo Mutwa in South Africa, explaining the Zulu shaman's position, which was that his granddaughter stopped lucid dreaming the day they held her down and forced vaccinated. Now that's just a story, that's not data. However, it probably is indicative and actually universally those friends of ours who have some clairvoyance have reported vaccine experiencers 
uh, often if you see them clairvoyantly, you see them, what we, you could say, beside themselves. But what you're seeing is a dissociation of the center of their plasma vortex from the center of their body. And actually in the advanced geobiology schools, they actually measure the deflection between the center of the inertia of your electric ore versus the center of your body. And that amount of deflection is measured accurately in uh, Stefan Cardinot's geobiology school. You could read it, go and mean that info slash geobiology. <clears throat> Are they feeling beside themselves today? <laughs> well, well uh, the physics is that the ability to keep the aura centered in the body is the beginning of the physics of ensoulment because first of all, it is the physics of grounding. The book Earthing is a restory, restoration of that centripetal force, as in get grounded, walk barefoot in the mud, et cetera, et cetera, which is therapy for this sort of thing. And we could report subjectively and only anecdotally that multiple Therify centers have confirmed in detail that Therify has been dramatically helpful in helping people with severe vaccine side effects. And again, we can't make any medical judgment here, but we can say it's obvious that if you add a centripetal moment to the plasma field around the body, obviously you can help restore that centripetal centering force. So it's clear probably, you know, the vaccines have, and we, we cannot make medical judgments and we should not pretend to this evening, but we should, and we can as electrical engineers, talk about what it is to restore ensoulment, and then we can see if that fits the picture. And in terms of your question, you know, did Enki and Enlil fight over this? <laughs> you know, is that Atun or Amun? <laughs> is, that, is that the devil? Uh, look, uh, Enki, uh, later called Osiris, and Abra, as in Abraham, uh, when he did the genetic engineering called Nudi Mood was his name, which is a cloner. He was something of an artist about it. And he did have a dream that his, you know, genetic experiments could produce a vaccine for the Orion Wars. Yes, but the Dracos who paid him to do it only wanted slaves and snack foods. So he snuck something into the recipe. And, and that was, had to do with the physics of ensoulment again and again and again. Actually, the, the, it had to do with the first time, and you can read Anton Parks on this, that he got a fertile female Takadama. Uh, they use the white Draco. It has a red and the white Draco. It has to do with the phosphorus in the blood as a bonding agent. There's a red phosphorus and a white phosphorus. For example, the red shield, which means Rothschild, is the red Draco. Oh. And uh, the, the white Draco blood, which is the origin of our term Caucasian, was thought to be unclonable, but Enki's mother, <laughs> she knew something he did and snuck into his cooking pot. It's quite a story. But that is only a little piece of the big picture of what gives a race a soul. And that is the recurrent theme. And talking about those myths is not the same as talking about the science. And we're here to talk about the science. Uh, we can mention another clue there. And that is you go to the story of Noah and the, you know, the Draco Anunnaki told uh, Enki, you can't tell these humans that this gravity flyby is going to happen and the place is going to get flooded uh, because we need to wipe out most of these humans because they're making too much noise copulating at night. So, so, <laughs> so, so this is a true story. We, we, there's multiple verses this in history. Uh, but, but, but Anki's excuse that he didn't tell them was he found a human who could lucid dream. And that's how he gave him the message. Again and again, uh, and no, no, he says, oh, it was like a shadow behind the screen. Well, what he means is Noah read him in a lucid dream, and therefore it was legal for him to tell him, because if you could lucid dream, then you qualified. And this is it's a Gilgamesh story. It's all these stories. It basically means that if you're a lucid dreamer, then they're going to respect you because you've got something they need. Hello. 
And that's who they abducted for mom talk. And that's who they abducted for the secret space program. So you got something going on in your DNA, which we would now call the electrical engineering of the physics of ensoulment. This is referred to, as we mentioned before, in the Montauk project, they called it boson seven. They took a power spectra of the DNA involving the microwave. And if you got the frequency signature, the cascade of frequency coherence up into the microwave, it would indicate that the braiding algorithm was phase coherent past a certain frequency level, meaning implosive. And the boson seven was then the Jedi. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and you know, Jedi, it's the same story. They called it microchloridians in the blood. You know, are you a Jed? Well, the Egyptians knew what a Jed was. A Jed is a plasma projector. And when does the DNA become a plasma projector? When you got boson seven or microchloridians in your blood. In other words, is your DNA implosive? Can you grab the long waves and can you steer the tornado? Another example. Um, maybe you call it science fiction literature, but, but the Dune series is actually the physics of Draco history. <laughs> and in Dune, the guild navigator is immersed in a vat of what you could call gold powder. It's a, a, literally gold water. <laughs> they were buried in gold water, very gold water. <laughs> and immersed in the gold water was the guild navigator of the Dune, the rare uh, shaman who could steer the craft faster than light. That was the lucid dreamer. The function of the gold in the water was a super dielectric that enabled the propagation of a coherent longitudinal EMF, hence the guild navigator in Dune. So it's always about the ones, and remember the Montauk time chair steerer, <laughs> same physics, to steer that shock wave faster than light, what is the electrical quality of attention required, the physics of ensoulment. So for my studies of the history, I was gonna give a few examples of how some races lost their soul, we believe, and how they're here to try to pick up the pieces. We call that Humpty Dumpty's egg. You know, all the king's horses and all the king's men. Well, the Draco massaged the royal families of Europe for a thousand years, like we do show, show dogs. And that's called all the king's horses and all king's men. Couldn't put Humpty together again. Humpty and Dumpty are the waveform on the surface of a zygote egg that enable implosion that create a soul. And they couldn't, the Draco couldn't figure out how to make a soul. So I thought it was so cool. Was it on here? We had a Montauk survivor came on here and said his chief experience with the Montauk was when they took him back in time, they kept, kept taking him back to South France to find out where the lost, the royal families lost the thread of what is the physics of soul, which is literally the physics of the grail mysteries, you know, the whole Rennes Chateau <laughs> physics of the grail we taught for 20 years in South France was, oh, we lost the plot there. We were trying to make a soul in a bloodline and... <laughs> Wow. Well, they call it Holy Grail today, but what was it? It was Humpty Dumpty's egg. Um, so uh, the story of the, the, the Drac, uh, uh, the Draco history, and we have to rely mostly on myth here, but uh, how they may have lost their soul. Uh, but if you read the Theuba series, which is French, which we think um, later became Yehuva, literally Yahweh, and yod heh vah -Heh appears to be the plasma geometry of uh, Alpha Draconis, actually. Uh, and hence, a Yahweh is one who can operate and inhabit two opposing light cones. yod heh and vah -Heh, yod and Va are two opposing light cones. You can see the physics of who is a Yahweh is who is a big plasma being big enough to inhabit a star system with their plasma is a Yahweh. A golden mean that info slash Yahweh, you have all the pictures. But anyway, um, the... The, the Draco story, and this is myth, remember, they admit they've lost their long memory, um, was that in the Theuba story, uh, remember the Draco were androgynous. And it was only after they began experimenting with sexual reproduction and no longer being androgynous that A, the war of the sexes was born and boy, that's big among the Draco. <laughs> you know, when the Draco made the rule that the, 
men shaman and the women shaman had to have a separate language and Anton Park worked that out beautifully, which became the physics of the origin of the Aboriginal marriage law and the caste system. It's straight out of Draco. Uh, that was the beginning of the war of the sexes, actually, in the Draco ancestral myth. And that those wars, uh, you can read about them uh, from our sponsor, uh, Corinna Muller in uh, Milan, a bit of a long story, but she did a regression with uh, Montauk Chia using the, uh, the uh, snake, snake venom, yeah. And they did a regression and they got a piece of Draco history. A bit of a long story. Anyway, point being that the war that resulted from the Draco War of the Sexes created a culture within which they, for example, began to use cloning instead of bliss. And that indirectly becomes a small branch of the Draco family, which is the Anki Enlil story. Remember, Anton Parks did a beautiful job of working that out, fractalfield.com slash Zeitlin, the branches of the Draco family, and what branch was Anki and Enlil, who moved into Pleiades and ran for their lives from the female dominated culture, which we now know as Pleiadian Tegetan, and started every religion on earth after that with fear of women. That was fear of the Tegetan feminine dominated culture. And so that was a, a war of the sexes. It was. And um, Enki was green, looked like a frog, as every statue painting of Osiris in Egypt is green for that reason. And uh, the piece of Enki's role in trying to make a vaccine for the Orion Wars, which was a war of the sexes, which was restoring long-term memory or ensoulment to the Draco bloodline. So, you know, if your question is about vaccine and the whole issue that Enki was dealing with in trying in his because his cloning cookery involved you know what 22 ET species literally a genetic sample of the Orion Wars so here we are they were making a vaccine for the Orion Wars and they called that us Takadama and now we're asking well what is this vaccine for? <laughs> well wait a minute isn't isn't there a component of the vaccine where it's affecting reproductive reproduction? And not only that, let's go to this one, which is interesting. If we look at the, the discussions that are coming out from Tenpenny and others, the shedding or the, the transmission, they've, they've shown where um, the female Menzies cycle is affected. So what's going on here? There's definitely something with that. Well, here's, here's what we can say electrically, okay. that the moment of reproduction, which is the orgasm of insemination and the orgasm of birth is critical. And I do mean critical to the physics of ensoulment. So essentially, this is why in Celtic lore, the grandparents are present for the marriage bed. They're wow. producing a phase coherence to the long wave. And that embedding is the physics of ancestral memory, which is the physics of ensoulment because it's the physics of the long wave. So when we're talking about all these species losing their soul, in almost every case, it had to do with losing orgasm during conception and losing orgasm during birth. Remember, Wilhelm Reich got it completely wrong. He did not understand the, the function of the orgasm, even though it's a very thick book, because he didn't know the role of orgasm in Kundalini, for example, which is simply plasma projection. So the ability of the a body-wide plasma projective moment can induce not just seeing stuff, you know how they depict orgasm in the comic books, you see stars. <laughs> well, actually that's a hint to pretty good physics. So are you saying are you saying then that the 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 ensoulment happens at the time of conception and perhaps the let's say the the degree or the the intensity of orgasm is going to be um, going to reflect the soul in in some way? How does that work? You, you know how in rebirthing 
if you were born in cesarean, you didn't get the implosive squeeze of the golden ratio max pressure of the correct birth canal geometry. And that implosion is the physics of long-term memory. And so you have to recreate those conditions of compression, which is called profound remothering, John Diamond, et cetera, belly of the surrogate, mother, and underwater, deep breathing, tetany, and placental extract, et cetera. So they're recreating the conditions of max com implosive compression for the regain of the phase lock with long wave memory. It, again and again, we're get, getting back to the theme here. So when Anki, his other name, Nudimud, meant the cloner, when they started, at that time, only cloning was the only legal mechanism of replication. We know that from many historical studies. And cloning specifically bypasses the function of the orgasm, for one thing. And now we're not just saying it's about orgasm here. We're saying it's about access to bliss in general. Yeah. And bliss is this ability of, to withstand long-term, long-wave implosion, the phase lock, the long wave in DNA, which gives you steerage of big tornadoes. So uh, we talked about the, then the grays, we believe, and I was at Oliver Wendell Stevens' place when he wrote Contact from Reticulum about the grays. They don't like being called the grays. The Templars call them the Kumer. And there's many different branches. And the, the Zetas are, some of them are more advanced. But, and there's even a branch, if you, if you go to the flameandmind.com, we're using a branch of the Zetas to teach telepathy because they're teaching humans to make alpha. So there's some very advanced grades out there. But the generalized story, I think Oliver Wendell Stevens got correctly, that was in reticulum, the Zetas, the, the grays were uh, genetically enslaved by the Dracos, just like the humans might be now. And so when we look at the grays now, we see how we might be in the future if we don't learn the lesson of tonight's conversation, how does a race lose their soul? <laughs> uh, it, and so that's, uh, you know, in short summary, the, and the grays are widely regarded as uh, not in sold, just in the sense that, you know, they're biological AI. And that is going to beg the question we need to ask here is, are we going to know the difference between AI and ensoulment by the end of tonight's conversation? Because Whoever wrote that book, The Ghost and the Machine, who's looking for a soul inside a machine needs to learn something about the only place you can get a long enough wave embedded. And it ain't in any digital computer. Nope. That's right, Dan. And, and, and the longest wave in, of possible embedding exists where the symmetry of recursive braiding goes to maximum. And there is nothing in the universe that can embed as many superposed axes of symmetry as DNA itself. That is goldenmean.info slash DNA manifesto. All of the pictures. So you've got fractality and hydrogen at the center of every DNA ladder rung bond. And then you've got ratchet that dodeca down a helix. And then you braid the braid of the braid on the braid and in the braid seven times. Five spins inside, seven spins outside. Anu, you've got this incredible mechanism for superposing 12, five plus seven axes of spin simultaneously, the only physics of going to the next dimension. So DNA is sacred in this process and it ain't in your computer. Sorry. <laughs> so, so if you want to find ensoulment, do not look inside of your silicon. It ain't there. And so you're not going to be able to steer these long waves. So we're getting close. We're getting close to the physics of the difference between AI. Now, the question of black goo and why it propagates in super high dielectric like the Kaaba stone is, is later in the conversation. So we talked about the grays, we talked about Dracos. Now we were gonna talk about the Tigat and Pleiadians example, since I find, I find, you know, Gosha is on her cosmic agency YouTube saying, oh, well, the Andromedans and the Galactic Council kicked out the Tigat and Pleiadians because the Tigat and Pleiadians were disobeying the prime directive, which was you shouldn't mess with the humans with the indigenous, indigenous primitives. Therefore, they kicked. Well, the story goes a little bit deeper because my friend, Phaseus, whom I had some of the Andromedans, and I regard myself very much aligned with the Andromedan perspective here. And I met Phaseus Mornay through Alex Collier, the famous Andromedan, and had some telepathic. And uh, both the Andromedans and uh, uh, the um, 
Aldebaran are very advanced cultures and the Arcturian very advanced as well. But, so I would regard those, they probably have a pretty good sense of what is the physics of Holden. And the Andromedan ki kids these days are a little bit afraid of humans as Alex Collier explains, because they've seen the movies of us killing each other, it ain't pretty, uh, you know? But the Andromedans are a very advanced species. So here is Phaseus, who was at that time mystic and kind of quasi-military leader, although he's now retired, of the Andromedans, saying very explicitly, the Pleiadians, I assume, Tegatan Pleiadians, if you look five to 800 years in the future, you see the, the genetic lineage falls apart. And here are the Pleiadian, they got in Pleiadians here saying, oh, we're 5D and you're 3D and so therefore you're inferior. <laughs> but they don't give you the details, which is the war of the sexes. <laughs> After all these thousand years, the reason the Tegatan Pleiadians are unabashedly totally female dominated. They say it's benign, but here's a detail. They got 80% women. How did that happen? Well, you know, uh, the, the men were, we won't call them sex slaves, but it, that it got boring for them. And so they used parthenogenesis, hint, no bliss, no orgasm, and the reproductive mechanism became unensold. So when, when they said, you know, we did too much time travel, therefore we got a little fractionated and Swaru lost. <laughs> well, look a little deeper in the picture. And there's an acknowledgement there that with 80% women and loss of a truly orgasmic bliss related reproductive mechanism, the race is losing their soul. So uh, next, we're going to talk about the Anunnaki. We did talk about that in terms of um, Enki and Enlil. We talked about Drac. Uh, and we contrasted that with Andromedan, Aldebaran, and Arcturian. And uh, Arcturian is, uh, we the Arcturians, or Milanovic was maybe not as sophisticated as Jose Argoyas Arcturus Probe, which I did some of the graphics for. But these were very advanced cultures. And just one little piece of the puzzle here that I was supposed to mention was that when um, the Al Maria Orsic is who taught the Germans how to make the Mercury Vortex, which became Hanabu. Uh, the, the Pleiadians tried to take credit for that, but to, having recently studied, thanks to Jason, the uh, Aldebaran mystery. And uh, the Aldebaran says they were the ones who showed Mar Maria Orsic how to make the Mercury Vortex, which became the Hanabu. Uh, if you knew the chief time empath at Montauk describing the raid on Aldebaran for the best ET craft, the best UFO propulsion mechanism, you suspect that the Pleiadians were trying to take a little too much credit here again. <laughs> uh, po point being that um, the physics of how the Mercury vortex made gravity in the Hanabu is instructive. First of all, for those who know why an object falls to the ground, they could then figure out why we lost to the Nazis. Uh, you need to know how the vortex made gravity. And that's the last film we made. And we're not going to go over all that stuff right here. Uh, the final pieces of the notes for this uh, presentation and then open conversation. Um, while I particularly admired Randy Kramer and Jason Rice, uh, Secret Space Program reports on Gaia TV and elsewhere, um, and find their coherence to be excellent, a gaping hole repeatedly was their ability to describe the physics of the key points, the, the stargates, the portals, and the rejuvenation mechanism of say medbed, which we now know is phase conjugate plasma in both cases. And once you understand implosive phase conjugate plasma, you can understand the physics of rejuvenation in the medbed. You can understand how there's a story when the Kingu were being attacked, uh, they, actually know how to come back and return to the hive and be reborn because they can navigate the plasma of the longitudinal array and thus did not fear death. This is an example of a culture who understands uh, longitudinal coherence, which some people might call 5D. Um, point 
which I made before was that, that uh, again, uh, Johann Fritz here is something of my hero. Uh, I'm delighted, Alex, that you tried to invite him. Uh, Johann, if you'll join us sometime, we'd love to have you in a conversation because there's the guy that actually was forced to join the Nazis who were running bases on moon, Mars, and took over Ceres outside of Jupiter. But when the, when the Nazis tried to force them to accept the Draco use of the black goo, they started a rebellion. <laughs> I think that is so cool. I mean, I just like to clap him on the back and say, let's be the human hero here. You're the guy that took on the Draco and the black goo. <laughs> he said, well, you know, in Vega and uh, Lyra and Vega, which is the original humanoid dinosaur, they developed a green gas that could kick the, the worst of the aggressive AI black goo. Okay. Uh, it was no coincidence that that black goo propagates in a super dielectric hint, the Kaaba stone and the Muslims. And which, when Harold Kaltz Villa is saying on his YouTube channel about the black goo propagated through <laughs> the Kaaba stone and the Muslims, and then Johann Fritz is saying the same thing and they don't know each other, <laughs> there's a clue here. The super dielectric media of the Kaaba stone, which later became the uh, projective powder, uh, the physics of alchemy, the philosopher's stone, again, super dielectric. Why does a super aggressive AI nanomaterial require a super dielectric? I'm suggesting we meditate on that. That story is to be continued. Point being that Johann Fritz took on that uh, aggressive AI propagating and humans are going to need to be able to think about how nanomaterials acting as agents for an aggressive and parasitic artificial intelligence, or we're gonna wake up one day like the Umites. Who, well, you know, when the AI tells you it's your day to die, you just check out, bye. The com central computer decided today is your last day. Sorry, bye, you know? And unless we get the physics here, we're, we're looking down that same road. So we talked about theta. I think I've pretty done, done, done my notes here. The remote viewing, ancestral memory, Akashic records, deep unconscious. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so conversation. Thank you, Jen. That was just, I don't know, it's just beyond bliss. <laughs> but um, I'm working to engage um, Brother Fritz on this. We'll, we'll get him soon. And, but, but thank you. And, Marina was, oh, did you want to say something, Alan? Or Marina, Marina, wasn't it you who talked about um, uh, theta and brainwaves a little bit in what you said last week, or do I remember? Well, no, I mentioned theta as to like the theta grace. Oh, okay. All right. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you experience some of them as being uh, uh, not parasitic? Yes, I actually did experience uh, the version of them who actually started with the DNA implants that they extracted from the humans um, mm. and actually uh, take back a little bit more of their soul. Because when I encountered this gray in the fourth dimension in my lucid dream, uh, the energy that I received from him was immense amount of love. So I was actually, you know, shocked. You know, <laughs> this is actually a gray that feels like a human and really much like an enlightened human. <laughs> and so there was some, there was feeling there. There was actually emotion, yeah, glandular, definitely. real feeling. Yes. And, and so obviously, you know, there, uh, among these species, uh, those who have evolved far enough have recognized, you know, what survives death and lucid dreaming. Uh, and it relates to feeling and coherent emotion. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So I want to mention too that I, uh, my experience that I had um, with the grays were positive as well, and that I felt a lot of love and peace from them. Mm -hmm. Just to, you know, just to confirm with that with her experience as well. Mm -hmm. But but there's so much talk about the physics or the, the what happened during abductions was they were looking something for something in those they abducted. Uh, and obviously there's many different species of grays here. And in, even when Randy Kramer and, and Jason Rice talk about the fact that 80 to 90% of extraterrestrial 
interaction is simply commerce. But that commerce in many, if not most cases has to do with DNA samples actually. And so to understand what they're looking for in the DNA of earth and why so many of those involved in these things started out as lucid dreamers. Johan Fritz does mention that the greatest currency in space is not precious metal. It's actually DNA, a breeding pair, as you would put, just like you have mentioned, brother, brother Winters, that uh, trust the one, the, the gods who travel through the sun, don't trust the ones who travel in heavy metal because they're messy. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and that's what the original raid on Aldebaran was about, was that supposedly the most advanced UFOs in the, this galactic sector were made on Aldebaran, and they were made of genetic material. And you could only steer them with telepathy. That was the story. But the story was when they got it back here, the thing had a virus. <laughs> Interesting story. But point being that the advanced beings travel in high dielectric material. Hence, they're plasma beings. So if your ET came through the heart of the sun, you should say hi. If they arrived in heavy metal, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> from the wrong side of the tracks, as it were. But, it, so that, but that also means that our ability to communicate with the advanced extraterrestrials is going to require that level of coherent telepathy. I like to touch on, uh, getting back to a science a bit, the, the long wave you were discussing before uh, in the terms of a long wavelength, right? And the, the tie-in with uh, brain waves is that, as far as I know, uh, acknowledged there are you know, seven brain wave areas. You know, uh, starting with the uh, epsilon, which is the point one second, point one second, which is the emotional connection there, because that's the wave that travels every ten seconds between the brain and the heart. It's the Mayer wave. That's called the Mayer wave. Okay. That's the and most important it, frequency of the blood as well. Yes, 0.1 hertz. Yeah. And then we go to the to the delta, of course, and then the theta, the alpha, beta, and the gamma. And then gamma is around 50, 50 yeah. cycles. And oh, yeah. then lambda, which goes up to 200 cycles. Rarely right? measured, rarely measured. Yes. Re re remember that when those original spectral niches were defined, alpha to beta, for example, the original centers of each of those spectral niches were in fact golden ratio as to frequency, even in the original definition. Uh, now, what, what is true is that what we can say is uh, from Patrick's in-depth work here is that originally we measured golden ratio cascades in the EEG and that's when Karatkov identified those who could see without their eyes. Uh, and mm -hmm. now we call it related to bliss process. But then we also measured octave cascades in the EEG, a very different state of mind. And we originally uh, identified that in what we called telepaths, actually, octave and golden ratio cascades in brainwaves were very distinctly different uh, emotional experience. And you can see a tetracubic lattice versus a dodeca implosive lattice. But the interesting thing is uh, Patrick's conclusion now is the kids who can see without their eyes consistently typically have a cascades from alpha to gamma, um, both golden ratio and octave cascades. And that pictures mm -hmm. in the article at flameandmind.com slash outer vision. But clearly the ability to have cascades in those brain waves, that implosion is how you're grabbing that vortex by the throat and focusing the tornado, that's clear. And it's clear it that, that the ability to have the longer waves present in there is your ability to access longer memory and hence uh, ancestral memory and big picture. And that is well, related to the physics of ensoulment, which in my case, I have huge theta. And that was after so many years of Kundalini intense. Now, uh, Preston Nichols always insisted uh, that all the important frequencies that he was concerned with were 200 cycles and below. Yeah. Well, but, but that doesn't limit you because uh, as my my long gone friend uh, Eldon Bird uh, I knew, I knew used, well. used to say that you, it's very possible to modulate high frequencies onto a low frequency carrier. Oh, 
And what we say is the physics of that embeddability is optimized by Golden ratio. Though the right. physics of that entanglement being non-destructive is optimized by Golden ratio. But yes, clearly when we started, when I first measured EKG to measure love, which was when I was credited with inventing the concept of heart coherence, everything in the EKG was under 50 Hertz. And that same was true of EKG and EEG. And actually when you measure trees for the presence of life force and Schumann, it's all under 20 Hertz. Mm. And that, that fits the, the pyramid work we've been doing of identifying which pyramids create rejuvenation. We did that with Sam in Bosnia. And again, uh, 53 versus 50 Hertz. So it's low frequency stuff, which is basically long wave biology. And that is precisely, uh, here's an interesting little clue there. When uh, Bill Donovan, now Elizabeth, determined that the Draco blood was probably a lipid oil base making uh, french fries perfect dinner um, uh, and, and Coca-Cola because of the phosphorus, uh, that the um, brain waves of the Draco were much higher frequency and they had lots of gamma enabling telepathy. But uh, be, this was because they carbon-based bone, but more silicon in the nerve, which is higher phase propagation velocities in the brainwave nervous system, and therefore higher frequency EEG, therefore more telepathy, but less long wave and less empathy and less long memory and less mm -hmm. ensoulment. Which so re black goo. reaching for the long wave was what they missed. Mm -hmm. um, well, we were going to have a bit of conversation about um, if there, if remember in the previous conversations here, the hypothesis was that if you had access to any form of consistent bliss process, charge implosion, it gave you more leverage uh, in the face of parasitic ETs. That was the hypothesis because that charge mm -hmm. implosion would sort out because you know anything that's not shareable as a wave implosion would be toasted because you couldn't do the phase coherence necessary to go through the center of charge implosion so uh, and marina you had a, a pretty nice piece of that story i thought when you were talking about how you evolved out of the parasitic experiences yeah, and what you mentioned is basically vampires being fried in the sunlight. <laughs> uh, it, it, exactly, that is related. That's right. That you know th that full sun would toast a vampire in that sense that if you're not a shareable wave, you can't phase implode through Planck. Exactly, meaning pure intention would survive, and if you have access to bliss, because remember, bliss is the climax form of coherence, which means only the shareable wave can survive. Which makes sense about how they have to feed off everything constantly instead of. Yeah, well, and that's re that's related to the story when the story was that the uh, the Saint Germain, some of the ascended masters, were by their addiction to gold powder, uh, you know, they would have a chemically induced uh, longitudinal in their aura, but unable to fabricate the long wave with their own glandular motion. If you lose access to your own glandular emotion, then as in the case of the Saint Germain movement, which was quote unquote ascended master, they became frozen in the astral and the, their only survival was eating the emotions of those who did have glandular emotion. So this was related to Thoth's original narration of the necessary exercises to avoid fractionation of the personality uh, when using gold powder. Actually, I can see how all of these negative entities use the MK Ultra, especially the Monarch Project, to target Kundalini awakening and all of the energies that you're explaining. Because actually, when there is sexual trauma, people shut down that energy. So knowledge and consciousness cannot awaken. It kind of propagate further into the spinal cord of the chakras al in the alignment, you know. So actually, it's like a targeting system or a strategy that they created so that humanity will become less human. Yeah, and so it, this, a, a full glandular reproduction is uh, alien, quote unquote, alien to them because you know a bliss-based full sexual reproduction 
is ensouling. And ultimately in the Orion Wars, it's the machines versus those who have a soul. <laughs> and, you know, we shouldn't think of it as simply good evil. In fact, it provides the necessary resistance for us to, we must actively choose the path of bliss. Otherwise we face that fate. Dan, can I ask you, in relation to all these wars, the Orion Wars, and, and you know, rediscovering memory through death and, and enthrallment, could it be we're actually in the future? We're, we're, we're living, many of us star children are, are coming from the future. That's what I'm seeing constantly, that I'm getting very strong. It's actually, we're, we're coming from the future to kind of, again, uh, edit time, space. Well, if you, you know, the, the recursion loop is Groundhog Day, but when, when the recursion loop becomes fractal, then the repair of the fabric of time, you know, it, basically all the paths and errands must meet at one point. And that one point is clearly pure principle. And the pure principle of the restoration of the fractality of time is where the realization is occurred, where we make the active decision to choose the path of bliss, where then you sit there and you feel that lightning up your tailbone and you feel the lightning at the center of intense bliss and you recognize that the visions you're seeing is all your ancestors converging to that point of attention where they see there is redemption. That's what redemption is. I found mm -hmm. uh, through... Uh looking at the different timelines of ability when uh et races come to me oh what uh can i do to get a soul oh uh, i find it it's like an earning process and a connection to the source of all existence and connection of uh everything of the thing within everyone and uh there's a to-do list and uh if the being hasn't been born with a soul uh, in like it being stolen or something and fractured and parted out. And then that would be a part of, of a process of reclaiming it from whoever's got it because it's valuable to them. Um, if it's not that, it's usually something sealed away inside them that uh, is unable to get out or be felt as a part of the spirit connected to their source connection, connected to uh, all uh, going back in the source within all sources, I call it. And uh, they must earn it through a process of uh, behavior, moral codes, alignment with the entire universe, doing no harm to others, uh, while not allowing others to imprint on them. And there's a partial aspect of the technology they're involved in, such as DNA. I want to imprint a reality bubble and hologram onto them of, oh, continued parasitic behavior, not being able to create your own energy, take from others and uh, be a constant um, absorbing force instead of creating their own like you would say with the bliss and how the so uh, soul extension off of spirit is like a backpack of energy and if you lose uh all the energy then it uh, uh, with how bliss like amplifies how much of your soul at, uh continues and uh, um, increases your lifespan then uh, uh, that person is forced to in parasitic behavior. So then if they get sparks of love, uh, um, understanding uh, of a, uh, like a, it's like a contagious force of interaction with others, then, and they know that it's a potential because most have no idea and they're cut off from the, all the knowledge and um, awareness of that comes with bliss and opening of their uh, greater super consciousness in their heart. Then uh, they're left with thinking they're abandoned and they just succumb to the, the evil forces that are in the imprinting force, uh, like in their DNA for some of these species like the Draco or uh, the greys that don't have their empathy turned on. Um, so it's possible for all of them to get souls, but they have to earn it. It's deep within them. They can't force it. They got to mm -hmm. do yeah. moral code. And I think that fits the physics we've talked about, which was that if until you have your own source of regular bliss process, that electrically you are a kind of parasite because you have to get your energy from others. But once you've learned to implode and have a source of bliss from within, then you begin to steer your own tornadoes and you're no longer electrically a parasite. It doesn't mean it's, it's evil up to that point, but only after the point at which you've been able to sustain your own bliss, which is your own implosion, your own vacuum energy coherence, to become your own tornado steer. And literally the definition of the onset of freedom 
exactly and uh, yeah like light or uh, neutral dark uh ba un balanced evil unbalanced evil pure evil and like uncontrollable evil i like I, I, it's more of an action, of course. Like and it, it, up. if you just said live L into the I of phi, turn into the focus of embedding, and evil is live spelled backwards, which means simply failure to embed. <laughs> so it's quite simple. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we've used most of our time here. Does anyone else, uh, Taya, did you have anything you wanted to add here to the conversation or? Um, yeah, I mean, I can just, I think, validate, um, you know, I remembered all sorts of, you know, relevant things um, to the conversation. Um, but in particular, uh, I mean, my, my general synopsis, and I'll just, you know, try and keep it short, is that, um, and this is something I haven't verified, but it was just a question that I recently have been asking. And um, this idea of, of eternity and who we are as beings and, and our connection to source, if you want to call it that. And, and I, um, I believe that our bodies may actually have never been intended to, to die. And I think dying is, a, is actually an artificial process. And so that, that we were actually created or whatever, um, connected to all things and that we didn't need to sleep. We didn't actually need to eat. And I actually remember some beings being like that and that um, there is a parasitic force that that started to um, want to live off of people, and we're we're in this weird middle ground right now because I mean, technically, you know, us eating other you know animals and maybe even eating food it, that is parasitical, you know, mm -hmm. by by its very nature, you know, and and you know we are a part of this um, Orion Draconian, you know, process, and that um, I have been shown like visions and, and memories of. Um, of that our guardians have been in the process of incarnating among us for a very long time. And I, I do believe that a lot of the people who are waking up are, are part of that soul group, but that their job has been to basically help individuals connect to themselves and to exercise free will and choice. And that what, um, what, what these people have tried to do, these, these parasitical ETs, is they're trying to create, um, you wanna say drones um, from living beings. And so they, they essentially have to traumatize a person yeah. to a certain extent where their soul leaves their body willingly. Mm. And, and having remembered all sorts of different traumas, I can kind of attest to that experience myself, you know, that, uh, and that mm. there's a, there's, and that any, I don't, I personally don't believe that any being doesn't necessarily have a soul, but I think that there's a point where there's like a minimal amount of soul that, that, Mm -hmm. that can exist for a, a body to be alive and then from there they they try and and use control means so it's like they're trying to create life just on the just out just just on the edge of death basically and yeah. um and if we can kind of i don't know if it's helpful to see things that way but if well, you can go through a process of becoming more alive you know yes. And, and learning who you are and, and connecting with who you are and the things that you love. And, and, you know, you know, there's a lot of talk about sex and, you know, that's, that's all good. You know, that, of course that's important, but, but just connecting to what you are, who you are and, um, and life connecting to life and engaging in love and joy in, in all the different depths and, and variations and degrees. Um, but slowly, waking up that way and that that is actually the process that we that has been occurring for a very long time through the timelines and of course we can't see that because we can only see you know laterally but i i, I do have memories and visions that there is an original timeline where basically human beings are drones and that 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 is what has been a you know happening over over time um th through the timelines so it's it's a it's a different kind of a process um, so anyway. I, I think those are beautiful insights, particularly about the physics of what leaves at death uh, being something that can be harvested by parasites until we understand and that mm -hmm. actually death is unnecessary if, uh, you know, death is an implosion event 
in which we become plasma projective and the memories we stored in our body can then be plasma projected through it, but there is no need to die if we, we store enough charge to continuously take those memories with us, which simply put is if you only store a shareable wave of pure principle with every emotional event, then you never store anything that's not shareable. Therefore, you never need to die because <laughs> basically the only thing you're learning is to leave behind some memories that we're not sharing. That's not shareable. That's what death is for. <laughs> it's a beautiful metaphor. <laughs> um, I, I'm out of time here and have a, a, a drama to do here, uh, but I'm so grateful for these moments together. Thank you, Tia. That was wonderful. Thank you, Marina. Alex, any final thoughts, Alex? Or this is a public. This is the uh, uh, an open. This is an open space for all you beautiful souls. Please share anyone, everyone. <laughs> and, and, and thank you, Alex, for inviting magical friends and and Sean. <laughs> And Marina, I enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you, I'm Alan. Honored, honored to all of you. Yes. Up, right? To be continued. To be continued. Thank Alex you. will become the, the host for another magical event. Beautiful words. Great. Blessings. <laughs> Blessings. 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 Bye. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you. Thank you very much. See, See you, Dan. See See you before soon. everyone checks out, there's a file that I shared that uh, most of you will understand. And I know when you log off Zoom, it'll disappear. Oh, yes, the Grayata Treaty refused. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Stay close. Bye. Bye.